This week we're continuing our series on 1 Peter. Uh, this week we're moving on to 1 Peter 1 verses 10 to 12. And it's uh, cunningly entitled Concerning This Salvation, which hopefully will make sense to you when we read the passage. We're continuing a series on 1 Peter, which is written to a group of churches in Asia Minor, modern day Turkey. And it's quite interesting that we're looking at this at the moment. I hope in your prayers is Turkey at this time after what's happened there. They should very much be in our prayers because we know there was a strong Christian church there. There still is today, but there are people suffering there today. They should, they should be in our prayers after what happened this week with the earthquake. So uh, let's remember them throughout our week as we're, we're sort of uh, praying for any part of the world. They need it really big time at the moment. But at this time in Asia Minor, the church that existed there was surrounded by pagan temples. And uh, this led to a way of life that our readers found very difficult to live amongst. It was incompatible with the new way of life they had found in Christ. And so because they were standing strong, they were beginning to be persecuted and suffer. Not in sort of wide scale persecuting, but just people were saying, you're different to us. You stand out and you no longer take part in the things that we do. And so they were struggling at this time. And so at this time, Peter decided to write a letter to them. And the letter began with these verses, which was instantaneous encouragement to them. It laid out their identity to them and their status as God's people. And he then moved into a, a section that we've been looking through over the last few weeks of of a 10 verse section of thanksgiving. Today we're looking at three verses from that, uh, the last three verses from that. But so far we've learned quite a bit from it. There's quite a bit in here and that's not a surprise because this is kind of a summary of what we're gonna get throughout the letter. And so we started off with the first, first three verses which gave us reasons to speak highly of God, to praise him, to speak of him with with gratefulness for everything he has done. And it spoke of his mercy. It spoke of his mercy in saying Jesus as a solution to our sin and for giving us a safe and secure inheritance that awaits the believer in heaven. Then we moved on to verses uh, six, six to seven. And Peter went on to speak about all the rejoicing that all that was spoken about in the previous verses should bring in the midst of all the trials that are going on in our lives and that we should actually find these trials to be precious, something that's good for us because they were refining us. So that was, that was an important thing. And then last week we moved on to verses eight to nine. Um, and he spoke here about the faith of the readers and obviously that we can include ourselves in that, which exhibits itself in the lives of the reader through their love towards and belief in Jesus. And this brings about a rejoicing, which is characterized by an inexpressible joy filled with glory. And I said that was boasting in the Lord, boasting about what God has done and who he is. And he's clearly focused on the blessed hope of the promise of salvation that we all have for our trust in Jesus. A blessing experience now, now, today, and tomorrow and into eternity when it will mature and we will ourselves become mature. So already in this statement, we've had an awful lot, but what we've got to remember is that this is a Thanksgiving statement, okay? It's a Thanksgiving statement. Peter is giving thanks to God. Even as he's teaching, he is praying. He is saying, thank you God for all these things that are in the believer's lives. And even through the prayer, we are learning great things about God and our relationship with God. But these things were visible. They were visible in the lives of the readers, of the believers. They should be visible in our life today. And so these things very much give the believers an identity, a, a sense of security, a lifestyle, a set of values, beliefs that belong to us only because of faith and the faith that we have in Jesus, a Jesus and, and a triune God that never changes. And so it's an amazing thing that we've been looking at, amazing truths that we've been looking at over the last few weeks. And he's now gonna close this section off before he applies it with one further statement about how great this salvation is, how great this salvation is that we all hope for. 
that we all put our trust in. So let's read the statement. Concerning this salvation, the prophets who prophesied about the grace that was to be yours searched and inquired carefully, inquiring what person or time the spirit of Christ in them was indicating when he predicted the sufferings of Christ and the subsequent glories. It was revealed to them that they were serving, not themselves, but you in the things that have now been announced to you through those who preach the good news to you by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven, things into which angels long to look. And these are great verses. There's an awful lot we can take from this. And hopefully we will hopefully get as much out of this as I have this week, just looking into it. It's been another one of those weeks where I've spent a lot of time marching around my lounge, giving myself little sermons as I go along. In our previous verse, Peter has been writing about faith and the outcome of faith, our inheritance, salvation. He now writes three verses, 10 to 12, that are to be read in the light of this outcome of faith that he notes in verse nine. It's considering the this salvation, considering this salvation we have received as the outcome of faith and our future hopes spoken of in verse nine. Now I said last week that verse nine appears quite loose after the intensity of the previous verses. And in the light of today's verses, it does become clear. Verse nine that we, we looked at last week has a sense of a breath being taken before he launches into one last breathless list of encouragements in the opening to this lesson. And I'm gonna approach this a bit different to how I've approached most of the other verses where I've dissected them bit by bit. This week, I wanna clarify one thing. I wanna point out three words that I think we need to define to understand the passage. And then, and then I want to look at five encouragements we can take about life as a Christian today and then, if we've got time, three lessons we can learn about studying God's word all from this passage. OK, so I'd better get on with it, hadn't I? So let's start with the three definitions and the one item to clarify. There's one thing about this passage that stands out as kind of a little bit strange and yet actually makes sense when you understand the context. I mean, there are four sets of people well, there's actually five sets of people mentioned, but there's four that we need to focus on to understand it well. Or three sets, four sets of people, one item, one doctrinal item. And we're going to skip over one of the people, but we're going to look at the prophets, the Spirit of Christ, angels and salvation. Now, the Spirit of Christ is interesting because it kind of stands out as kind of a little bit different. And it seems a bit strange in a sense. It says, inquiring what person or time the spirit of Christ in them was indicated when he predicted the sufferings of Christ. And the question here is, who is the spirit of Christ? And it's quite obvious. It should be quite obvious to those of us who are Christians. It's the Holy Spirit. So we've got to ask the question. And it's an important question because some people get a little bit spooked by that phrase and get a little bit tangled up in it. So it's important to understand why the Holy Spirit, who is mentioned later on in the passage as the Holy Spirit, is here called the Spirit of Christ. So why? Why? Well, the Bible clearly makes a distinction, clearly makes a distinction between the person of Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit. We know that. So that's why it's a bit strange that they're kind of put together at this point. Yet the Holy Spirit is sometimes called the Spirit of Jesus or the Spirit of Christ, a designation that, as I've said, has caused some people to assume that the Holy Spirit and Jesus Christ are the same person. That's where the confusion lies. Now, we know this is not the case. We know that. So there has to be a reason why. So why is the Holy Spirit named differently here? Well, it's quite simple. The reason as to why the Holy Spirit is called the Spirit of Jesus Christ, the Spirit of Jesus, the Spirit of his Son, those are the separate names, was because he was sent by Jesus Christ to remind the world of what Jesus Christ did, not because they are the same person. Now that refers back in a sense to John. Remember in John's gospel, Jesus said, I am sending someone to you who will teach you everything about me. 
the Spirit of Christ, the Holy Spirit. That is the Holy Spirit's function within the Trinity. That's what the Holy Spirit does. He points to Christ. That is his kind of role within us. Even within each and every one of us, he points us to Christ. When your eyes are opened by the Holy Spirit, what do they open your eyes to? They open your eyes to everything that Jesus Christ did upon the cross. That's what the Holy Spirit does. What does the Holy Spirit do in worship? The Holy Spirit points us up to Jesus. He lifts us up to Jesus. Jesus opens the door and takes us into the throne room and we worship before the throne of God. That is the amazing Trinitarian sort of idea we have. And so here, this is actually quite a, it's an interesting statement because it can throw you, but at the same time, it should be taken for granted in the sense that it is the Holy Spirit. And for the disciples, the Holy Spirit was like having Jesus Christ with them in a new and meaningful way. Because as we know, the Holy Spirit, Jesus Christ, and the Father are one, yet three, at the same time. They have the same immutable characteristics but they have different functions. And so when the Holy Spirit is within you, Jesus is with you as well in so many ways. There are so many ways you could look at this. Now we can get really complicated and I can end up becoming a heretic at the frontier by saying something accidentally, so I'm gonna be careful. So while the visible presence of Jesus Christ is no longer in the world, he is with believers in the person of the Holy Spirit. And this is the likely reason the Holy Spirit is known as the Spirit of Jesus or the Spirit of Christ. That's the one thing I wanted to clarify. It's the Holy Spirit that's being talked about there, the Spirit of Christ. It's the Holy Spirit, just with a different designation. And so that's one of the things we need to know as we approach this. So inquiring what person or time the Holy Spirit in them was indicating. So that passage makes a bit more sense when you realise that's the Holy Spirit being talked about, hopefully. But then there's some other words here that need clarifying. You see, we've got the word prophets mentioned, which means pro equals before, before or forth, plus thimi, tell, before tell, forth tell. So these were persons in the Old Testament. We've got to remember, we've got a context here. We're talking about the prophets, not a prophet. So we're not talking about prophets today. We're talking about prophets past tense. So we're talking about the prophets who prophesied about the grace that was to be yours, that was to be yours. And so these guys, it's a very, very simple statement. They were persons in the Old Testament inspired to proclaim or reveal God's will or purpose to men through utterance or divinely inspired revelation. The prophets foretold future events and would exhort, reprove and even threaten individuals or nations as an ambassador of God. They were, all, they were interpreters of God's will to men. They would come, they would speak, they would leave a message. Sometimes it was for them, sometimes it was for a few weeks down the road, and sometimes it was way into the future. The prophet spoke not his own thoughts, but what he received from God, and that's really important. Everything the prophets received was given to them by God. It was not a man having a rant. We've all been in a place, haven't we, where someone thinks they're a prophet, but really they're just ranting. I've been in places where someone has told me I'm a prophet and they, they go off on a rant and they're not a prophet, they're just a ranter. These were prophets, they were definitely speaking something they had received from God. Even though they would retain their own consciousness and personality in this prophesying, here and in chapter two of this letter, people will tell us the prophets were led by the Holy Spirit. And so that's really important. That's a definition of prophets for you, just to help us to understand the passage. And here are a list of Old Testament prophets. We've got Abel, Abraham, Amos, Daniel, David, Deborah, Elijah, Elisha, Enoch, Ezekiel, Habakkuk, Haggai, Hosea, Huda, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Joel, John the Baptist, Jonah, Malachi, Micah, Midian, Moses, Nahum, Nathan, Obadiah, Samuel, Zechariah, and Zephaniah. Some of you are sitting there going, where'd John the Baptist get in there? He is the link between the Old and the New Testament. He is the last of the Old Testament prophets. Okay. He came before Jesus in terms of when he came. He was born before Jesus as well. 
So John the Baptist is, the, is classified as the last of the Old Testament prophets. So that's quite important. So a list of the Old Testament prophets there for you. So what's the next word I want to look at you with you? It's this one. Very, very simple. Angels. We've got there things into which angels which to look. To understand that, we've got to know what an angel is. Now, I know most of you have said, I know what an angel is, Tony. You don't have to keep telling me. Well, it says here, got the word there, angel from the word, Greek word angelo, a messenger, envoy, one who is sent. In both the Old Testament and the New Testament, one of a host of heavenly spirits, superior to man, belonging to heaven and to God, and engaged in his service. They are described as beings sent by God to earth to execute his purposes and to make them known to men. Hence the reference to angel, messenger of God. They are subject not only to God, but also to Christ, who is described at his return, surrounded by a multitude of them as servants and attendants. Now they do, we do know, I want you to note this, angels are spirits, that's really important. They do not have material bodies. However, they are described as appearing either human in form or can assume the human form when necessary. That is the strictest biblical sort of outline I can give you without wandering off into lots of different ways and interpretations of what angels are. That is the strictest definition I can give you. And I want you to hold on to that because it's gonna be important as to this, this phrase at the end, things into which angels long to look. Why is that even significant? Well, we're gonna, we'll understand it hopefully because we now understand a little bit more about angels themselves. And then we got that word, we're considering this salvation. So it's important again to remember what salvation is. From Sutter equals saviour, deliverer. Now you're probably thinking, why are you going over this, Tony? Well, one of the reasons is, is I'm not gonna assume that you remember everything I say every week. So it's important before I talk about this to remind you once again, what this means. What does salvation mean? Well, it means not just escape from the penalty of sin, but includes the ideas of safety, deliverance from slavery, preservation from danger or destruction. And in the Old Testament, which we're referring to the prophets, so we're talking about the prophets here. So in the Old Testament, it's quite relevant to know what they thought. In the Old Testament, it conveyed the ideas of deliverance from present danger or trouble, especially from defeat in battle, as well as giving a foretaste by, by the righteous after death of the enjoyment of the age to come. And Peter has already shown us that our present salvation is an anticipation of the salvation to come, our inheritance and an outcome of our faith in Jesus. That is a very, again, that's just a very simple definition of salvation. So now I've introduced those three words, I don't have to go back to them as I'm going through the exciting part of what I wanna to talk to you today. I'm gonna to mention all of those things, but I'm not gonna define them every single time to you, okay? I'm gonna talk. But what I wanna do first is, I wanna show you, I wanna do something very, very different. I wanna give you some summaries of the passage that we're looking at for us to meditate on before we actually look at the really great encouragements for us, Christians living in this age can gain from these verses. So these are some, some writers, some commentators, the main books that I have. There are lots of commentaries on 1 Peter, but there are two main ones that a lot of people use today. The first is one by a guy called Wayne Grudem, and his summary of verses 10 to 12 reads like this. The purpose of this paragraph is to show Peter's readers that the spiritual blessings they now have are greater than anything that was envisaged by Old Testament prophets or even by angels. Thus, Peter seeks to increase its reader's appreciation for their great salvation in Christ. And I think that's great because that's exactly what this passage should do for us. Quite often with these Thanksgiving statements, we read them and then skip on to the, the main body of teaching. But Peter didn't intend that. He wanted you to read this and be instantly lifted. 
So as you're reading the rest of the book, you're already reading it encouraged, encouraged about the situation that you are living through. So that when he puts the tough challenges to you, you're already encouraged enough to go on. And that's what he's doing here. He wants you to increase your appreciation for their great salvation in Christ. That's Wayne Grudem's words. It's a summary. Howard Marshall says this. Now, I didn't know this till this week, but do you know Howard Marshall lives near the Cairngorms in Scotland? There you go, just in case you didn't know that. So he's probably a, a mate of you and come from the same area. So the Holy Spirit has revealed that the readers are living in the time when the prophecies of salvation have been fulfilled. This confirms their Christian experience and gives a firm foundation for their future hope. He provides a rationale for the relevance of the prophetic writers to these Christians, to these Christian situation, and thus emphasizes their privileged position. Now you're gonna hear that word privilege a lot today. I know it's a dirty word in our society, but actually it's a word that covers each and every Christian that has ever lived during this age this church age that we've been living through since Christ has been and ascended into heaven as we await his return. We are privileged. We are fortunate. We are lucky. I mean, people don't like that word, but we are, we are so privileged to be Christians, to live in the light of this salvation. And Spurgeon goes on to reinforce this with what he says about this passage. See you not your privilege then. You have what prophets had not. You enjoy what angels desire to see. They cannot enjoy what you do. Rightly does our hymn put it. Never did angels taste above. Redeeming grace and dying love. And you have this. This very day. This salvation is yours today. You know it, you live in it, and it will be fully revealed to you in heaven. What a great thing. See not your privilege then. That's what your, these verses should reveal to you. Why? Let's get into it. As I've said, Peter is ending this session, section with exciting encouragement to these Christians about the privileged lives these Christians live, despite their seemingly bleak circumstances. In this new and most excellent church age, they are privileged. So let's examine this now. We start with this phrase, verse 10, it says this, concerning this salvation, the prophets who prophesied about the grace that was to be yours searched and inquired carefully. Peter tells his, re his readers, ancient prophets predicted the grace that would be yours. You are living something that was foretold. That should excite you. This is no happy accident. You are living in the light of something that was foretold. The prophets predicted the grace that would be yours. Hundreds and hundreds of years ago, before Christ was born, this was foretold. It was promised. It was predicted. And it was fulfilled in Jesus. And the fulfillment is no accident. If anything else in our world was to come true in the way that this came true, through the predictions of a holy book, we would be studying it like mad. Do you know, a few couple of years ago, Hollywood made two big blockbuster movies, 2012. 2012 was the, was the year that the Mayans predicted the world would be destroyed. And what did Hollywood do? They made two major blockbuster movies about it. They spent hundreds of millions of dollars making movies to scare the life out of us all about this prediction. Guess what? It didn't happen. And yet there are still people today writing books about it. Still people today living in the light of this Mayan prediction. 
and yet they don't have what we have. J. Barton Payne has found as many as 574 verses in the Old Testament that somehow point to or describe or reference the coming Messiah. Alfred Edersheim found 456 Old Testament verses referring to the Messiah or his times. Conservatively, Jesus fulfilled at least 300 prophecies in his earthly ministry. How many of you can number more than 10 of his prophecies? In any other walk in our world, if we knew there were 300 things that had been fulfilled through somebody who we were putting our trust in, we would want to keep looking at them. We would want to keep reading them. We would want to study them. And the prophets did. The prophets, as they gave these words, gave these words, searched and inquired carefully, even though they hadn't yet seen Jesus fulfill them, they were inquiring carefully about something they hadn't seen fulfilled. We've seen it fulfilled. How carefully do we spend? But it's something that is predicted. That should excite us. We should be supportive of movie makers that want to make movies about our faith. We should be writing books, poems, songs, singing loudly about it, because this was predicted. The grace we have was predicted. That's what that is telling us. Next up, inquiring what personal time the Spirit of Christ in them was indicating when he predicted the sufferings of Christ and the subsequent glories. You live in the great time of glories, which was long foretold. They boasted about these things. We live in them. We live in them. As we stand by faith for our Lord, we know Jesus personally. We can point to him and we experience the blessings of his salvation in our lives today. We can do that. Those three things there, we know Jesus personally. He's a personal, we, we've actually met him. We cannot see him, but we have met him through the power of the Holy Spirit. We meet him every, every time we are lifted in worship to him. That's a pretty awesome thing. We can point to him. We know where he is. I know where my, my Jesus is. He's in heaven. And I know where you can find out about him in his word. And I know where you can meet him through the power of the Holy Spirit. And we experience the blessings of, our sal of his salvation in our lives today. You are blessed. Even if it's something as simple as that person sitting next to you is a child of God. You get to experience him through seeing him at work in the life of your partner, your friends, or every time you open your Bible, you get to experience the blessings of his salvation in, in, in your life today. It's a pretty awesome thing in itself. And though we may suffer trials and persecution, there is in a sense never been a better period in history to be a child of God. Now that may sound strange to you. Yes, okay, the Garden of Eden, some of you, one of two of you might shout out. Okay, you might shout that out. But they fell in the Garden of Eden. They fell. Our salvation is assured. It is solid. There's no going back. We've been made holy and righteous by the blood of Christ. That's a pretty awesome thing. We live that security. There has never been a better period in history to be in a child of God. And that's what Peter was telling these guys. It's never been a better time. You see, these guys, they hadn't met him. They didn't know Jesus personally. They wrote about him. They prophesied about him, but they wanted to know who it was. They never met him in their lifetime. They could point to him in their prophecies, but there was still not a fulfillment as we have. We can see it fulfilled in Jesus. They could just point to it and say, that's what's predicted. Wait and see, wait and see. And they weren't able to experience the blessings of his salvation in their lives because Jesus hadn't died yet. He hadn't. We have to be open about that. So there's a lot of things going on there. 
The next thing, it was revealed to them that they were serving not themselves, but you. But you. The prophets were in fact repeatedly ministering for the benefit of you. The Spirit revealed to the prophets that the prophecies would not be fulfilled in their lifetimes. Therefore, as the prophets continued to speak and write God's word, and as they laboured and faced persecution, they were serving not themselves, but their words were for another era. To be understood by the believers in Peter's day as well as believers today. As I've said, they were ministering to us and they, that was revealed to them. I don't know about you, but that's sometimes, I, I find that sometimes hard. It's, it's a difficult thing. Mel sometimes says to me, why are we here in this place? Why is anybody called to any place? I think about missionaries in the past. There's, there's a great missionary. He was, he was sent to a far corner of the world. I can't remember if it was China or India. But in the entire time he was there, he saw one convert. One convert. Man being sent by God to go and find that one convert. We know the Bible teaches us that's what God does. What I do know is that after he died, the church in that place flourished, grew exponentially, massively. He went, did something that was really for the benefit for the people who were going to come afterwards. That's what the prophets were doing. They were ministering for you in the past. They gave their lives for you. They put their necks on the block. One of them was lowered into a cesspit for you. And any of you who've ever had to sort out a cesspit in your back garden, well, no, that's a pretty horrible thing. Especially having to stay there for a while. How many foods passed down into a place full of poo? Because God had told him to stand for him, for you, not for his own benefit. That's pretty awesome and exciting. And also says that the salvation I have is grounded in these guys from the past, in God's people, which I am now a part of. My people, the prophets, did this for me in the past. That's pretty amazing. Let me get to this, the next bit. In the things that have now been announced to you through those who preach the good news to you by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven. World-changing events have now been proclaimed to you through the working of the Holy Spirit sent in epoch-changing new power from heaven. Do you know I'm preaching to you, to you today about world-changing events? World-changing events. Greta Thunberg has a bigger congregation than me, and she's selling something that some scientists, and I say scientists, credible scientists, are saying aren't even true. And yet she gets a bigger, a bigger audience than me who's talking to you about world changing events. They're being proclaimed to you today through the power of the Holy Spirit. Prayer goes into what I speak to you guys. It's the Holy Spirit at work. It's not me because I'm pretty useless. I'd rather hide in the corner. Seriously, hide in the corner. My wife will tell you. We've had people sitting in our back garden when it's been time for us to go out. And I don't like walking past people in, at any moment. I am a timid as a mouse in a strange and awful, awful way. And when we first moved in there, it was even worse. We had Bible study on a Friday night. They'd be out there eating their dinner. Mal, would, Mal actually said to me once, oh, stop being so ridiculous. They're our neighbors. Don't be so fearful of walking past them because I was so shy. I was scared they were gonna notice me and say hello and something stupid was gonna come out of my mouth which when the Holy Spirit isn't working, is what happens. Stupid, inane nonsense come out of my mouth, but when I pray about it, God works through me. And it's the Holy Spirit that does that. The Holy Spirit sends this out into the world. He empowers each and every one of you when you are speaking about God to somebody else, it's the Holy Spirit that is using you to talk about world-changing events that have now come to pass. That's pretty awesome. I and mean, it should be an awesome encouragement to us. And what is this world-changing event? Well, it's the great sacrifice of Christ that offers salvation to mankind, which Peter has talked about in his preceding, his preceding verses. He's also been talking about this. He's been revealing it through the power of the Spirit. Remember, this entire book 
is written by the power of the Spirit. That makes it incredibly important to us. It comes by the Holy Spirit, which emphasizes that the proclamation of the gospel by men was by or in a power beyond themselves. And that in itself should be an encouragement to us. It is not by our power, but by God's power that we preach these words to you. And that Peter preached these words and wrote these words in this book. That the prophets wrote these words hundreds of years ago. That Abraham decided to go because of the words of God. He did that. Everything that happens has happened because of world-changing events that have now been proclaimed to you. And then we come to the last bit. Things into which angels long to look. Angels long to look into these things. I mean, the truth is I could have just put what's actually in the verse there instead of actually writing another sentence and rewording it. But we were taught to do that in English when I was at school. So we tend to do that in, in Britain. Angels long to look into these things. As believing Christians, we get to see this foretold message, the good news, play out in our lives. The Holy Spirit brings us this message. We accept it. And it becomes part of our story, drama. One of the words that's in our text is used elsewhere uh, to be this idea of drama and story that we are involved in. The world thinks of us as insignificant and worthy of pity or scorn for our faith and trust in Jesus. You know, we've got this amazing message in our life. The world thinks it's insignificant. They think it's worthy of pity or scorn. And yet the angels, who I've just told you a whole lot about who they are, what did I say? Where do we stand in the pecking order? God, angels, man. We're down the scale. We are a little below the angels, the Bible actually says. The angels who see ultimate reality from God's perspective, find the message and the people willing to trust. The reason I've put that in green, the message and the people, is because these are the things into which the angels long to look. So they find the message and people willing to trust it to be objects of intense interest, for they know that these struggling believers are actually the recipients of God's greatest blessings and honoured participants in a great drama at the focal point of universal history. The world may scorn you for believing in sky fairies, as one Telegraph reader wrote in the comments section under a certain article, but the angels who are more intelligent, who spend more time with God, know him best. They long to know what you know in the way that you know it. That's really interesting to think. They long to look into it. They long to experience it, in a sense. Now, I'm not, I've got to be careful there because you can quite easily cross a line here talking about this. But we're being shown another great encouragement. We have something that these angelic beings don't have. Salvation provided to us from our Lord and Saviour, Jesus Christ. And it changes us. It renews us. It changes our very being. And so... These encouragements that I've just outlined to you, these five encouragements that are drawn straight from this thing are meant to encourage you. They're meant to show you how privileged you are. As men and women of faith, you are privileged to live the lives you live, to be intimately taught by the Holy Spirit more of the truth of Jesus each and every day. The prophets were desperate for it. The angels longed into it. And mugs like me stand here and proclaim it to you every single week. And I say mugs like me because sometimes we feel like mugs. When you're standing in front of a congregation and they're looking at you, I'm quite grateful that my eyesight is gone because I no longer can see your faces. 
But I remember I had a friend called Sheila Bergere. And Sheila knows this. She's a really good friend of mine. Sheila used to sit in the front row and she's got a thinking face that is a scowl. And every Sunday, whenever I was doing the preaching at Nancoat Church, you'd stand there and you'd be terrified because Sheila would be giving you the look. Now, three rows back, thankfully, there was another lady called uh, I can't, Mrs. Norton who always smiled at you. And it was quite interesting because Sheila would quite often come up to you and say how great it was. And sometimes Mrs. Norton would come up and say, I was really puzzled by some of what you said, Tony. So you're never quite sure. Never take a frowny face in front of you as meaning they're not listening, okay? Because Sheila always gave you that look, terrifying. And so sometimes it's difficult, but you are privileged. You're privileged to hear, to know, to live, to intimately walk this message every single day of our lives. And we should think of our lives no less interesting to the angels than the lives of the people that Peter is writing to here in this passage. And that should be pretty exciting in itself and should cause us to think to ourselves, are we doing what they're doing? And this is why I say there's three lessons about the Bible we can also read in this passage, which I think it's important to take on board as well. Now I have four minutes to get this out to you. Here it is, concerning this salvation, the prophets have prophesied about the grace that was to be yours, searched and inquired carefully by the Holy Spirit, things into which angels long to look. We're talking there about scripture in a sense, as well as our lives in, in the last one. We're talking about scripture. If the prophets who were tasked with bringing the message kept on searching the scriptures and the angels who know God so well and by dint of who they are, are obviously more intelligent than us, long to explore these things, how much more should we whose lives are lived through these revealed truths of God's salvation plan, Christ, and by the sending of the Holy Spirit, want to look into them too? This passage should be, it's such a great intro to a lesson to, to a letter where Peter is going to teach people because it says, hey, I've written some really encouraging words. Don't switch off. I've got more for you. Read it carefully. The angels, they're doing it. They're reading this carefully. The prophets would have loved to have heard about the things that you're looking at now. And there are people who have proclaimed this to you, putting their lives on the line in some cases to do that. So you should want to do the same. But there's several things we can see in here as well. There's some important stuff. We can see that the Old Testament is a book that we should be reading. We should be looking at these prophecies, going back and reading them, finding out, looking at the context, reading about them. Because the Old Testament is not a time-bound book with prophetic messages just for its original readers. It has a future orientation that speaks to the churches of to today. There's things in there that we can learn and benefit from. So don't disregard the Old Testament. There are churches today, there are people today who are saying more and more, we should disregard what the Old Testament has to say because there are laws in there that are out of touch with what we would do, that they were important to the people they were given to and for reasons. I love the one about mildew. I'll tell you something, in Cornwall, we've got a massive mildew problem. It's a health issue. And God deals with his people by saying that mildew is an unclean thing that should be scrubbed from where you find it. It should be destroyed. If only our council heard that message and believed it. No house in Cornwall would have mildew. It's an interesting thought, but you never thought about that before. I don't know, something to think about, but there's things in there that we can learn about, absolutely amazing things about God as well. But also we can see these amazing messages about Christ. There is a continuity in God's revelatory or salvatory history. If we read God's word, we'll see that this is not, like I said, some happy accident. We'll see there's a continuation of flow through the Bible. And we've got the end story as well in there. We have the book of Revelation, so we can even look forward to what's gonna happen at the end. We've got the entirety of God's word. Nothing needs to be added to it and nothing should be taken away because there's a continuity there in it. And so it's really important to search God's scriptures and spot that. And finally, one thing we should learn, because these guys were careful. 
They had to be. You see, there were some things that these guys were searching and inquiring that these guys were told were for now. There were prophecies that were given that were for the moment they were given. And there are parts of the Bible that even today Christians are taking out of context and using in ways that are wrong. We do it with passages all the time. I mean, I'm going to put a passage on the board, okay, just down here. It's from 1 Peter. She who is at Babylon, who is likewise chosen, sends you greetings. And so does Mark, my son. I'm going to tell you something that every commentator agrees on. This verse was not intended for you. I know. If anybody is sitting there today thinking that they're going to go to the mission field because of this verse, you are wrong. This verse was written on behalf of she who also lives in Rome, who is also a child of God. She sends you greetings. And so does Mark, who was also in Rome, my son, my fellow friend. There are things we can learn from it. We can learn that Rome was seen as a place of riches of lu and luxury, that was seen as a place of great awfulness already in the church at this point. We can see that Christians loved each other so much they sent greetings to each other. And we can see that Peter feels very fondly about Mark, as we should feel about our fellow brothers and sisters in the faith. But what we are not to see is a prophecy that foretells something that you should go and do today. You are not called to go to Iran. You are not called to seek out someone called Mark, who will become your son and head off there. That could be one strange interpretation of it. I'm saying we need to know the context. We need to learn what God wants to teach us because there are things we can learn from it that could be valuable. But it's a message for that time, just as some of the prophecies in the Old Testament were for that time, but they teach us about God. And they teach us about God's character, God's justice, God's righteousness not what is going to happen to the British government today. I know that's hard and there are some parts of the church that are immediately excommunicating me because I'm obviously not charismatic enough to be involved in their prophetic ministry, which has been drawn from a strange text in the Old Testament, which bears no relation to what they believe it means. I know that, but we should be studying our Bibles learning about them, getting into them. Do you know there are people who go to university and study Jane Austen for three years? There are people who go to uni university and study the thermodynamics of Star Trek. And yet there are Christians who spend hardly any time studying their Bible, even though it has changed their life and it contains everything they need to know about the hope that is in their lives, that they, that has given them, granted them salvation. And so these three verses, like I've said, they are breathtaking, but I can bet you bottom dollar, most of us have skim read them. I know that because I've done it myself. We've skim read some of these verses, but there is so much beauty and amazement to be found in them. And we're going to be learning more about what's contained in these 10 verses as we go through this book of Peter, because within these 10 verses are largely what he's going to open up on as we go through the book. Some of you will be thinking, wow, I've read some of that book before and I've never realised that. Never thought about that before. Hopefully we'll get to some of that as we go through it. But this is exciting stuff. It's dynamite if we spend time thinking about it, asking the Holy Spirit to lead us to understand it. So that's where I'm going to finish today. We have a great passage. We've had a great opening 10 verses, 12 verses of this passage, of this book of the Bible. A great introduction to who we are in Christ. We are the, 
We are God's chosen people living at a privileged time in history, looking forward to our future inheritance where one day we will be made mature and whole and experience salvation in all its fullness at the throne of God. That's what we've learned. And if you've learned nothing else, if I get knocked down this week and there's someone else standing here next Sunday, you've learned something amazing from this that you can take with you to your grave. So I hope you do that. I hope you take it on board. Because I've been seriously excited by this. Unusually so. I'm not always as excited as, as I look at the front here. But I'm very excited by what Peter had to say in the opening to this letter. So let's pray. Father, we thank you and praise you for the carefully written words that the Holy Spirit gave uh, your disciple Peter to share with us and with these guys in Asia Minor. We thank you that they are life-giving words of hope that give us hope in these dark times, Lord, where the world seems to be against us, where the world seems to be putting us down, where the world doesn't want to hear your message. They're running after shiny things, Lord, or things that are, you know, easier to comprehend in one sense because they can see them. But we have a faith in you, Lord. We have a faith in a God that, that yes, we cannot see, but we know you're there because of the power of the Holy Spirit in our lives this day. So Lord, just help us to live it out. Help us to glory in you. Help us to boast to this world about you and just live it in Jesus' name. Amen.